<laughs> How are you? I am jet lagged, but I'm still uh, still awake. Still Good. awake, which is important. <laughs> um, Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, you know, we've been talking about you doing one of these for a couple of years now. And yeah. I finally got you. So Good. I'm I'm losing my my e, uh, EFL talks virginity. Good. I'm so glad. <laughs> so, you know, I'll give you a big EFL hug next time we see Thank each other you. somewhere. Okay. We will. We will see each other soon. Hopefully. Great. All right. Well, Gabrielle really doesn't need any introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. Uh, he's okay. a teacher who applies the lessons learned in the classroom to his roles as educational consultant, teacher educator, materials writer, and researcher, and an overall great guy. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, buddy. Oh, uh, thank Likewise. you. And I'm going to let you get to it so Good. we don't run out of time, okay? And we'll Perfect. talk later. Thank you again. Wonderful. Please, my pleasure. All right. Okay. I should say good afternoon, everybody. Uh, now I'm in Montevideo. Just eight hours ago, uh, ago, I was in Miami. I don't know how I'm here. But anyway, um, I want to talk about scaffolding. Uh, and you may think, like, what? Well, basically, I've been listening to these amazing presentations we've had today. And um, I thought this would be a suitable way of ending um, such a burst of inspiration from our colleagues from around Latin America, because in my opinion, above and beyond methods or didactic configurations or ways of teaching, our job boils down to just one thing, providing students with the right opportunity so that they can learn. And to me, within the field, that is the final scaffolding. I did ask a lot of colleagues what they meant by scaffolding, uh, and I got all these incredibly diverse answers, which means that we are not quite sure what scaffolding means. And if we could extrapolate, then everybody who talks about teaching has a different definition for it. And I think that one of the conundrums of our profession is precisely that. What is it that we are about? What is it that we are supposed to provide our learners. So let me get started with my definition of scaffolding. As you know, this is a term that has been in the field since 1976. And the whole idea of a scaffolding is being learners with this, uh, uh, adequate support so that when they cannot do something on their own, there's some assistance. That doesn't mean simply find things for, for them, but just providing them the tools that would help them solve the problems that they cannot solve. And this is from a problem solving perspective, right? But scaffolding is not only that, because the true the, the first definition appeared in 1976, is an article by Wood, Brunner, and Ross, and they were talking about tutorials. And of course, a tutorial interaction is generally one teacher working with one student, one, only one helping them solve a problem. And they define scaffolding as the process that enables a child or a novice to solve a problem, carry out a task or achieve a goal, which would be beyond his, this is 1976, no politically correct language, unassisted efforts. Well, this definition took a lot of bad rap because what these guys were saying is, well, let's make, things easy for them so that they can do the, the, the job. So they can solve the problem, uh, fulfill the task, whatever, why not. My take on it is a little bit different. To me, scaffolding is more along the lines of the, this definition by Mabin and his colleagues. Uh, I'm not going to read out for you. But I want just to think I want you to think about scaffolding as bestowing upon the learner control over the learning activity. A good scaffolder, a good mediator, is somebody who can read the learner, his or her uh, present condition, and then provide the tools. And I'm talking from a very Vygotskian perspective here. 
a tool um, <clears throat> that would help that person take control over the activity and in doing so, discover his or her potential. For scaffolding to be a truly mediated experience, then we need certain conditions. These conditions can be summarized as the following. First of all, intentionality and reciprocity. That's my hook. There has to be intentionality on both participants. Both the learner and the teacher have to come together in order to interact purposefully. And it's not just enough to have the intention to interact, it has to be reciprocity in the, in the interaction. So it's more or less like dancing, where one person leads the other and vice versa. This idea of intentionality and reciprocity may look deceptively simple, but it is not. Because what happens when we have classroom management problems? for example, in the classroom. Or if we extrapolate this to helping another colleague develop professionally, how do we develop that intentionality and reciprocity without the, well, we know, the selfishness or the jealousy that in general permeates our profession. So intentionality and reciprocity are the first condition for something to be a truly mediated experience, for a teacher to be a facilitator, a true facilitator, and for the learner to be an active learner, whoever the learner and the teacher are. Second condition is that if I do my scaffolding so that the student solves this problem he or she has today, I'm not allowing that student to actually progress into the future. If I see the student as an imperfect, um, or unfinished product, then I will not be able to give the student a proper scaffolding. What I have to do is I have to transcend the here and now. I have to position myself at the end of the process. What do I want this learner or colleague to be able to see to, to do in the future? So when I do my scaffolding, I position myself in the future and look back. And from the vantage point of the expert that I am, because I have access to this knowledge, I will give this learner the necessary information tool um, or participation space that will allow them to take one step further. But always having in mind the end uh, performance that this uh, student will have to accomplish. So let's say I take a beginner student. I'm not going to consider a beginner student an imperfect speaker of language. I'm going to consider an in-progress speaker of language. And I'm not going to simplify my talk so that they can understand by enunciating very clear, uh, clearly, because that would be patronizing for the learner. We have all been surrounded by learners who have amazing uses of colloquial English they pick up from watching videos online. So they are able to get the, re the real exposure to authentic language that they deserve to be able to be articulate speakers of the language. So intentionality and reciprocity plus transcendence and of course meaningfulness. When we talk about meaningfulness, and this, this is a quote, I'm quoting myself, I'm sorry, but I, I really love what I wrote here, that meaning is not only an a priori condition, but also an ongoing process of negotiation. So it's in meaning making when two people intentionally and reciprocally interact with a view of what they want to be or do in the future, that we construct new meanings and we reconstruct our understandings on the go, right? <clears throat> that is like the game of um, peekaboo, when a mother and child play. Uh, that game is intended for the mother to, to, to get the child to cover his or her face, right? So the idea there is to bridge a gap. And I say one of the principles that makes Anything that we do meaningful, and I go back to good old Prabhu 1982, create a gap, an opinion gap, a reasoning gap, or an information gap in the activity, <clears throat> and allow for that gap to be the place where new meanings are negotiated. Next comes the current world. In many parts of the world, and Latin America is no exception, we are still 
uh, particularly in public education, working with very limited tools. Our um, uh, delivery of teaching is basically textual or pictorial at best. But we know that our students live in a multimodal world, and that world is not always reflected in what we are able to do in the classroom because of limitations. One thing that we can all count on is most of our students have access to devices. and They have access to experiences outside the school that even when you cannot use the technology inside the school, you can bring that reality in. And we can use those tools to help them make meaning on their own. So those contingent multimodal tools that we can bring in or that the students can bring in will in turn act as mediators of the learning. And last but not least, I would say that a true mediator learning experience has to have a social to individual orientation. And here I want to address the issue of correctness. For many years, uh, we followed the idea that students are exposed to the language that will pick it up. We know that that is not true. When we say, oh, okay, don't worry, don't overcorrect, they will take care of uh, correctness in the future. We know for a fact, having seen generations and generations of people who went through four, five, six, seven years of a study of the language, who are still imperfect speakers of that language. We want the students to be able to be correct. And this is what I mean by social to individual orientation. Socially, if you speak with broken language, you are not taken seriously. If we give our students this imperfect grammar and or our colleagues, I mean, we know we have a huge problem with teachers' proficiency around Latin America. So that was the last thing. And just a few ideas for you to, to round off uh, things that you can do to scaffold learning. This is a work in progress, and I would be interested to know what your ideas are about how we can beef these ideas up. And I want to thank you all for listening. And I know I see Rob on my screen. That means my time's up. Great. Gabrielle, 10 minutes with you is never enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, the topic, I have a passion for this topic because I, I, I feel it, it can be the answer to many of the problems that we experience as a profession. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again. And we'll talk very soon, I hope.